Thank you to Isaiah R. for sponsoring today's video. We had an interesting comment the other day under one of our videos, and it says, as wannabe screenwriters and novelists, we focus way too much on our story and the rules of story, while the people who succeed at this stuff just pump it out no matter what the story is. Remember that. Drop the mic. Wow. I like that. Um, Do you agree? Uh, they're being very... Uh, specific. I don't think that, that you can't throw that template over everything. Um, I think that there is a, for instance, in most studios now, if a theatrical marketing team doesn't sign off on your work, it doesn't get greenlit. It doesn't matter how good the script is. If the marketing team doesn't have any kind of confidence in it, it's just not going to get made. Or it might get made, but you're going to lose money because they're not going to throw money at it. So I think that, I think that the churn and burn kind of thing is a reflection of the amount of distribution platforms we have now. The streaming world, you know, um, there are a lot more places you can take low budget material and license or sell it, right? The way to make money is um, being able to churn those out. I mean, the Lifetime model is a perfect example. Lifetime don't necessarily buy movies, they license them. So I make the movie for $300,000, right? I take it to Lifetime which they've already seen the concept and have said, you know, yeah, we would buy something like that. I make the film, they license it, um, they might put it on their subscription-based or their advertising-based platform, or they might put it on both, which means you make more money. Either way, there's no marketing involved, but there are fees involved, so they pay me for the license. So, and that's usually a three to four year period. After that, the film is mine again. I own it. So I can re-license it somewhere else. So I'm making pure profit. Um, so I think the sales aspect of it and being able to churn it out, those movies, if you want to make money, you've got to churn it out. You've got to churn and churn, it, which does affect the quality sometimes. I've seen Lifetime movies, which you can see the sound boom in some of them. Someone bought that because they need the content. Tubi have come out saying they want to buy or license 100 films a year. That's, that's their mandate. Um, and Mar Vista is, a, is used to be owned by Tim Johnson, um, which he sold for, thing, I think, $130 million or something. All lifetime Hallmark-focused uh, fare that he built over time. And um, net, even Netflix are buying that material. You know? So that's expanded. Um, uh, but I think that, that the, the comment that you made it seems very cut and dry to me. I, I don't know if I agree with it holistically. I still think story is essential. Um, is it essential to selling a piece of content? I still want to believe that. I still think that the story, no matter what budget level you're working at or what platform you're looking to release on, what draws me into a, into a film is the story. You know? But what draws me to that? It's marketing. You know? um, how do I find a film now I'm with, with everything that's so convoluted? The, the way I find it is I know what I like and I know where to look for it. Um, but marketing is still essential. And I think that, that sometimes story gets lost in that a little bit or it can be sacrificed to that. But for my mind, I still believe that if it's a good script and it's a good project, it will rise to the top and someone will find it and make it. And, and that comes from the base of story not because it's a great concept, you know. The amount of times I get a script and, and someone will say, look, the script is not very good, but the concept is great. I'm like, well, I've got a folder of 200 concepts. If I want one of those, I'll just do that. I want a good script. I don't care if your concept is good. I don't have to spend two years developing it. We now live in a world where the churn is also important if you want to make a living at that level. Um, or you're playing in the 10 to $15 million budget range, which is very easy to lose money in, unless you're one of the main studios that have a really tight distribution model. It's fascinating as, as Halloween is upon us to just go into Tubi and type in a keyword and just, I, I love looking at all the titles and, and the picture art and it runs the gamut of <laughs> <laughs> all sorts of stuff but it's fascinating and you can learn as much from great films as you can from ones that you can tell maybe were produced for very little so well yeah and it's it, it's the same you know 
when I'm teaching as well, one of the things you don't, you don't just want to read good screenplays, you want to read bad ones too. Because we're all going to write bad ones at some point. Um, you know, um, hopefully less bad as you go along, but I think, you know, being able to identify bad work and why it's bad um, and why it doesn't work is just as important as reading a good screenplay and why it does work. And, um, you know, you can go on any untold st streaming platform, you know, and find movies that were made really cheaply and are quite bad to watch and identify why, you know. Um, but uh, the desire for content right now, I had this discussion, I had this discussion with uh, an investor recently who was saying, oh, you know what, media stocks are down. I'm not, I'm not interested in investing in media. And I said to him, if you're looking at the stock market as a way to gauge whether you should be investing in movies and film, you've got it all wrong. Now, sure, media stocks on Netflix and those places will go down because they're cutting staff, because they're cutting production budgets. But looking at it from a venture studio point of view, it creates a great opportunity for people who, who are creating low budget material because um, these companies are now getting more and more in the acquisition game than they are the production game. And so they're, more, they're going to be more interested in licensing films or buying them rather than producing them themselves. And you're going to see that continue. So if you are an indie filmmaker and you are looking to, or you're an investor who's looking to invest in, in somewhere in the movie and TV industry globally, look at those low budget, look at the low budget material because the chances of you being able to make break even or make your money are much better now than they used to be. And, and nothing against the films on Tubi. Some of them that are low budget, no. they're actually very enjoyable to watch. They are so. very enjoyable to watch. Yeah. And even they make their own content too and their original material is also very good sometimes. It's hit and miss because of the churn. They are required to meet content quota. And, you know, they're not alone. Everyone's going to miss. Hulu misses every now and then with a the movie. Um, and I think, you know, content creators have never been in a stronger position to make a living. You know, a decent living? <laughs> I'm, still un I'm still unsure about that, but... but um, a decent living, sorry, in LA. A decent living in LA. Or, or, or New York, right. but maybe more so in, you know, a small town somewhere. Yeah, the Midwest. it becomes harder when you don't have a network. And I think, so I think that that's, you know, that statement that you said is, is something to consider, but at the same time, seems a little too cut and dry to me because there are variations on that.